Well, good morning, everybody. I wanted to begin with some satellite data this morning because as the sun was rising, we can see a large area of quite clear skies uh, this morning. And as a result of the higher pressure that built in here behind a cold front that slid through, we do have still have another day, another morning here of widespread uh, frost advisories with some freeze warnings into parts of Ohio, Pennsylvania, getting right here along the spine of the mountains in uh, parts of Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. Now behind this is very windy conditions, but take note of the cooler air that still sits in this part of uh, the coastal parts of, of Washington and also into the Columbia Basin here that we need to be thinking about because the upcoming pattern is going to be largely driven by, I think, where this temperature contrast is going to set up. So we're going to talk about that again in a few seconds. But I'd like to take you back to yesterday just to show you, um, you know, as the skies cleared out, a couple of interesting things to take note of. We did have some severe weather over the weekend in parts of the Carolinas as this system, which dumped a lot of rain on Texas, finally exited east. We could see again uh, kind of some of the wind direction coming out of the north northwest here. Uh, the smoke uh, from the prescribed burns showing up quite clearly on the satellite data. All right, with all of that, let's kind of get into a bit of a discussion about the winds that we've been seeing because we know that we have these strong winds again forecast for these areas today. Remember that um, really, really windy springs are driven by temperature contrast. And in fact, all wind is driven by temperature contrast. So if you take note over the last you know, 30 days, we have seen much colder air at times getting into the Canadian Prairie and the Northern Plains. While we've maintained such warm air across parts of the South, Mid-South, Midwest at times, and even East. And given the cooler conditions that have been in the West, we've been able to get the troughs to dip like this. And they've kind of ridden along this temperature boundary. And essentially, the greater that temperature contrast, the greater the height variance is in the atmosphere. And ultimately, that is a pressure difference. I'm talking about the thickness of the atmosphere. And that's what's driven a lot of the strong winds we've seen across the country. And we'll continue to do so until this pattern uh, begins to fully evolve into summer where the temperature contrast goes away. And that's why we generally only see our strongest wind systems in summer coming from thunderstorms. Okay, with that being the setup, I want to show you next a very important figure. Uh, this would be low level humidity and it's relative humidity. And um, what I'm interested in looking at this particular graphic is primarily this right here. What I've been quite concerned about um, for a while now is the, the dryness that's in Texas. We've looked a lot at the North American Drought Monitor. You know, we've been trying to pay attention to where this dry air is. But with those strong winds, oftentimes initially starting from the south but quickly turning to the west that have come into this critical part of the Central Plains, Western Corn Belt, Hard River and Wheat Region, it is important to note that the air there is already overly dry. And my point behind saying that is we have to break through this barrier in order to return moisture into this set spot, which means we've got to get, it's kind of like a, um, a strike against the area. In other words, to pull moisture over it, to fill in the gaps, then to make the precipitation is what the atmosphere will have to do in this region. Now that's not to ignore parts of the southeast, especially down into Florida, or how wet it's been. The humidity has been so very high because these systems have kind of come right in like this across uh, the west coast for so many weeks on end. In fact, you can see that if I show you the low-level wind flow, we've had a lot of flow like this that's then made the turn. And as it's done so, it's kind of pulled at times moisture, excuse me, the lack of moisture out of parts of, of Mexico into New Mexico and Texas and such right in through there. So I think it's just important to evaluate the way the wind systems have been behaving just as maybe a clue as to where they might be going as we stretch this forecast video out and look at the month of May again. And we're going to do one more analog year today, which will be 1973. And then tomorrow, I think we're going to do a summary um, of all of that. So uh, here we are. This is the weekend's precipitation through 5 a.m. In fact, it's just a hair after 6. I bet I, yeah, good. there's the 6 a.m. map that just came in. And uh, models did a very good job of picking up on the incredibly heavy rains that were down in this part of Texas as that frontal boundary stalled out. We saw the severe weather over the weekend right in through this part of the Carolinas. But a lot of our cotton belt got a, a pretty big drink of water here. That, of course, means uh, save, I should say, uh, this part of, uh, of Texas uh, between Amarillo and, and Lubbock here. Get a little bit farther to the north of that, coming off of the Rockies, a lot of this was snow. And I want to show you quickly how much snow we got. Last 72 hours, pretty broad swath here of, of better than six inches that got into this corridor with a widespread one to three around that. Now, just thinking about snow, I thought you might want to see these maps, uh, just given that we're about to make this full transition into a mild uh, spring time period, I think. 
And what you've got here is uh, the season to date snowfall uh, beginning on September 30th of last year. And I think it's often easier to see these by looking at either percentages or departures. So here is my percent of normal snowfall map. Again, uh, just kind of looking at the very wide distribution of snowfall uh, amounts here. And this is the departure from normal. So just take a moment, pause the video and have a closer look at these three maps. Just might be instructive on how we think our water resources may look going into spring. For the West, this is quite important. So I wanted to give you the latest basin average snow water content uh, map uh, through the 21st of April. And it is important to note that part of our northern Rockies getting up here into the Cascades, again, this was kind of an ongoing story throughout this winter. That was a region that uh, just did not see the bigger snowfall amounts. We, we have snow in the mountains, but it's not to the extent that we are, um, you know, looking at outstanding spring water uh, from the melt off of this. And given that we're concerned about the mild, potentially mild air that will be in this area in the month of May and the rapid melt, that's just something we have to consider uh, going forward. Meanwhile, down in parts of the uh, the Colorado Basin, both uh, upper and lower, good snowpack. We can see in the Great Basin, the Sierra Nevada Mountains, we have much above average snowpack. So just a quick check in on those numbers. All right, do want to let you know that the pattern actually does still produce a bit more snow in the West. And if we just look over the next seven days from the operational European model, there will be multiple troughs that are still coming in the West, which is a concern for me based on their temperature pattern, recent history and temperatures, and um, what this could mean in terms of some untimely precipitation throughout parts of the West, given where we are in the growing season. So if you don't mind today, rather than showing you the ensemble, I'd like to just start with the European artificial intelligence forecast of the trough ridge pattern. I feel like it has been doing a great job at capturing events better. Uh, so here we go. Through the beginning of this week, through Monday night, we're going to watch a low sneak right here along the U.S.-Canada border. And it's going to go, this is the guy I'm talking about right here. It's going to sneak right over the Great Lakes. That is as the system you saw in the satellite data exits east. Behind this, this would be Wednesday. What we're concerned about here, Wednesday into Thursday, is a series of troughs. There's several shortwave troughs. There's one, two, and three. And what we're concerned about as we get later in the week is as on Thursday night when this trough ejects, we're looking at the risk of severe storms here. So that would be Thursday night. Then do you see where the second one comes in behind it? So as this low ejects and goes out on the day on Friday out ahead of it, there's going to be a reinforcing low that sneaks in behind it over the four corner states. And we're going to see a reset getting into Friday night and Saturday of the severe weather here over the southern plains again. Now, the question we've always asked and the one I would like to see a solid answer to, are we going to get into a setup where a trough of low pressure like this is capable of stopping that train of dry air from this area, but advecting that moisture back into this region to start to deliver precipitation farther to the west. Now, I'll show you the forecast in a few moments, but that is what I'm watching most carefully. We have got to undo this drought situation that's in the midsection of the United States. Okay, as we play forward, this is getting into Saturday and night. We're gonna keep an eye on that second trough. But as we go into the weekend, and that trough basically comes from here and goes straight up toward Wisconsin. I'll show you the preset pattern from that in a second. Take a look what's going on in the west. Another deep trough of low pressure comes diving into British Columbia in the Pacific Northwest by next Tuesday into Wednesday. And what we overall see in this pattern is we, we just aren't losing this look. And that's generally a very active look for the United States in terms of generating spring thunderstorm systems uh, that come off the Rocky Mountains. That, as you know, it's their forward speed, their ability to draw moisture back toward the Rocky Mountains, and then how they play out the severe weather as we progress farther and farther to the east. So just taking you out there 10 days with the artificial intelligence model, I think it's got a pretty good handle on this pattern. Okay, what again we need to have a discussion about is 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 our last 30 days of precipitation compared to normal and i want to remind you that while this area has been quite wet maybe even a bit farther back a lot of the moisture that you see here which is being reflected in a 30-day positive anomaly this was from one event we had a little bit this past weekend but a lot of this has evaporated on stronger winds and on um, on warmer temperatures so what i'm concerned about is you know i'm probably not doing justice to the full outline there, but that just seems to be this corridor over which 
this drier air continues to be drawn through and each storm system isn't able to pull the moisture back far enough to the west to, to hit that region hard with moisture. So given you know this is our overall setup, let me show you where this pattern is going to take things. This is for this Thursday. Storm Prediction Center has already got a 15% area out on Thursday, and this is getting into Friday. Now watch, as we go from Friday to Saturday, it seems like there's a reset. But just remember, that's because there's one trough that comes out first, and then the second trough that comes out behind it. And this would be the second trough setting this up. So we do have three days. This will be Thursday, Friday, Saturday, watching for the setup of severe storms in the southern plains and central plains and parts of the Midwest of the United States. Okay, to get there, let's start with the high-res models, though, and this is going to primarily be a story about a low that skirts right in through this area. So this is this morning on Monday. Oops, let's get a refresh on that. There we go. This is this morning through Monday afternoon and evening. See this? That low pulling the moisture right through Minnesota and Wisconsin, parts of Iowa. The frontal boundary that makes it over by tonight into uh, Michigan, coming out of Ontario, and stretches right back into this area. So this will be overnight tonight. There's that frontal boundary. By Tuesday morning, heavier rains coming into parts of you know I Ohio, excuse me, Indiana and Illinois, maybe stretching back into Missouri, maybe some snow up in the UP. This is Tuesday afternoon, and that frontal boundary hits New England, but stretches all the way back into the mid south here. And here we are playing through Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. And this model run will take us out to midday Wednesday. That's about it. There's, there's just one system sneaking through and we watched its front deliver precipitation. After that, this is where we land. Now take a close look at this. This is the European Artificial Intelligence forecasting system, seven day forecast on total precipitation. And the potential for delivering not only the severe weather, but the very heavy rainfall in this region is high. Now, remember, model resolution and forecast inaccuracy is not going to give us the hard boundaries on where this heavy rain is going to be. We're literally using this just to find a pattern. So I see the multiple troughs that come through here and the deep one that hits the northwest in the next seven days on the artificial intelligence forecast system. Again, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the severe weather setup is here. Let's compare that to the national blend of models. A little bit different projection. Again, I'm still working on the restructuring of all of these maps for you. But what we've got here is now the setup uh, from a, just a suite of models blended together here by the National Weather Service. And as I look at it, this again becomes my major concern. How far to the east is this you know, very dry boundary going to be in parts of Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas? But you can see clearly to the north of it and to the west of it, excuse me, to the east of it, we're expecting quite a bit of precip. All along the south, a relatively drier week ahead. And then again, we're going to watch that trough come in the northwest. Let's go ahead and put it on to the European operational run. Now, the European operational run is one of the runs that starts to initiate storms farther and farther to the west. And this will be something very important to be watching in through this area. Now, we've already had flooding rains down here recently and decent rains over the weekend that hit parts of the southeast up to the Carolinas. So to see a little bit of a drier week here is not a bad thing. All right. But just take a look at that seven day forecast from the European. And here's finally the GFS. Now the GFS, just take note. And I'm sorry I keep pointing out this one area. It's just an area of major concern for me uh, as I look at it going forward in the summer forecast. All right. From here, let's go have a look at the probabilities. This is the chance of getting an inch in the next seven days. And here's the chance it's staying under a half inch. So we can really see these drier areas against where the wetter conditions are going to be. If we pop that up to two inches and I take you out to 10 days capturing the next three short waves that come through, here we go starting to see better and better chances of heavier rain coming in this area. Now there's a, kind of a love and hate with this, right? We, we'd like to also plant a crop right now and we need to get some stretches of drier weather into this region. But at the same time, we need to get the spring moisture to fill up that profile such that if it goes drier as we go farther into spring, we're able to, um, you know, we're able to overcome uh, any sort of short time period of drought in any area that's able to recover this moisture. So let's watch it carefully. Here's the chance of an inch over the next 10 days just to show you the, the full spectrum here. All right, let's get in and look at it. 
GFS left, European right. We've already seen the first low. There it is, sneaking over the Great Lakes Tuesday into Wednesday and curling up into New England. Take note that the GFS operational brings snow into the interior of New York, uh, you know, deep north into Vermont, New Hampshire, and parts of Maine. As we let this play past Wednesday, the next low is coming in. So you take a look at the northwest here. This is on Thursday. We're going to watch Thursday afternoon and evening for the low to start to eject. This is the first one, right? Remember, there's two. First one ejects here. This is giving us the risk on Thursday night for severe weather. That low moves, see it right here, moves toward, you know, Minnesota, the Dakotas, draping that front down here on Friday. But we know on Saturday, there's the second system. See it right there. So this is going to be the one on Saturday that produces the risk of severe weather re resetting it back here uh, into this part of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. So that's that's the, this is the end of this week, <clears throat> excuse me, Thursday into Friday and into Saturday, Sunday. Now note, another low is hitting the Northwest by early next week. And that's that deep trough that we're expecting to come sliding into here that could add more snow into that region. And as you took note, I'll take you right here. Take a look at the difference in the placement on Sunday night of the low. Here it is in the GFS, there it is in the European. And the GFS is trying to dump a bunch of snow here. So if we take a look at this, this is the snowfall probability of getting an inch over the next 10 days. And I just wanna keep an eye on this area for the potential for that. Take a look at the snow coming through parts of Ontario into Quebec, and then there's a little bit into the interior uh, of the Northeast. Here is the G, or excuse me, the European. So again, the GFS, 10-day, one-inch snowfall probability, the European. Now, thinking about all of this, this is what the temperatures have looked like since March. And this past weekend dropped some very, very cold air in here, and we're way behind on the accumulation of heat in the West. That's been a pretty strong narrative. When we look out, whoops, I have that out of order. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I want to come back to temperatures in a second. Forgive me. I wanted to show you first the two-week uh, temp uh, precipitation outlook. Uh, let me get reset here. It is important to note, look at the difference between the European model this morning and the GFS. The GFS is quite wet across the south. The European has a much broader area that's wetter than average across the north. And these two maps are set to the same color ranges, just so you know. So there is a bit of a change coming after the next 10 days, which will be active, that suggests wetter conditions across the north as we start the month of May. And it's not in the, in the, uh, in the GFS, but it is in the CPC forecast. Okay, so let's come back to this again now. Temperatures. We've struggled to get heat in the west, and we've had at times very warm conditions here across the east. This is our morning frost map. And I want to show you the timing of the frost events over the next seven days by going to our min temperatures. So I make these maps using the National Digital Forecast Database, which is a product made by the National Weather Service. And I find it to be a, a, one of the better temperature forecasts. These are daily min temperatures. So this was this morning's lows getting into Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning. Remember behind that low that sneaks through first, we have some cold air. So there's our frost line. As we go forward into Thursday morning, keep an eye on it right here. And then getting into Friday morning, it's primarily gonna be in the Northeast. This weekend on Saturday, major warm up. Sunday, we're gonna start watching the next trough come in the Northwest. On the high temperature side of it, here's today's high temperatures. Getting into tomorrow, so again, the low here. But you'll notice by the end of this week, as the colder air exits behind the low that's just sneaking through, Major warm-up comes into the plains first. There's Thursday watch, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. A lot of warm air is returning to this area. But that next trough of low pressure is setting thing up, things up across the west uh, to keep it cool. And remember, that's going to be the broader trough that sets off the Thursday, Friday, Saturday severe storm risk in this part of the country. Now, what's interesting to note is that the northern plains aren't picking up a lot of extra heat through this next seven days in terms of the pattern. And the GFS suggests that day 5 through 10, we keep that area cooler. Day 10 through 15 starts to show a mild return again. But I do want to point out that it's not really in good agreement with the European. The European model day 5 through 10 is more mild east of the Rockies, still cool west. And it keeps that pattern around all the way to day 10 through 15. All right. 
So where do we go from here? Well, let's do a couple of things. I'm gonna pull up a new graphic here. Let's go to the CPC site. I do wanna show you their newest outlook for um, week three, week four. And the more mild air to the north, as we begin this month of, of May, suggests that the potential for another deep frost event late kind of sneaking in in early May seems to be minimized. I'm talking primarily for this area and through here. But their week three, week four precipitation pattern to me suggests we're not going to slow down the activity in the pattern, which means multiple troughs kind of ejecting, which is something we're going to have to keep a close eye on. One thing that's making this challenging to forecast is the MJO is still collapsed into null space, and we're unable to really use it as a strong indicator on where things are going to go. One thing I will be watching with you very carefully, though, over the next few months is the position of our subtropical highs. So, so far in April, one of the most dominant features across the northern hemisphere has been the positioning of a high-pressure cell here. Now, if we end up developing a high-pressure cell there in summer, I'd worry about another one sitting here and the potential for another one to sit there. But as it stands, this high pressure cell is what's been helping to drive systems down into the western United States, and that's what's causing them to eject into this area. We've also seen colder air coming over the top at times, sending lows into this region as well. But the Bermuda High right now, okay, which is normally sitting right here, it is a bit weakened on its northern side. Just want to point that out, but we're not yet into where the Bermuda High matters for summer. Okay, so don't don't read anything more into this other than to let you know these are a few things that I'm watching and observing. Because over the next 30 days, as we take note of it, there's still higher than normal pressure here and lower than normal pressure there. But what it seems to be doing is setting up a pattern again. See how this just dips out of the southwest, keeping things active. So if we zoom in on the United States and look at a 30-day outlook in the month of May, let's get that out there. Take a look at what the models are doing. That's May. Just continue to keep this whole region active and stormy. I don't think it's going to be enough to shut every planting window down. I'm concerned about the ability to draw the moisture back farther to the west, as you know. But overall, it looks to be a pretty stormy May for the midsection of the United States. Temperature-wise, let's go look at that 30-day outlook. Okay, still cooler across the west. I still think there's some snow feedback in this, but if we end up getting that kind of pattern, we just get troughs that come into this area. And as a result, we do stay on the cooler side of average. So that's your new May outlook. I told you I wanted to cover one more analog year, and that would be 1973. Last week, I talked a lot about 2020 as a strong analog for me right now. But I want to show you 1973 for one big reason. The CFSV2 forecast model has been very aggressive on ending El Nino. And at times, now not currently, but at times, it's driven ocean temperatures way down here at almost two and a half degrees C below average by fall. It has since backed off. Okay, I want to let you know that. The new CFSV2 forecasts have now moderated in their ensemble average the depth of the uh, La Nina they had been predicting. But it's important to know that the, one of the recent times where we saw a very strong El Nino event that by the following winter was one of the strongest La Ninas was 1973. So it was right here. And then we watched this. Sorry, I can't seem to draw a straight line today. Do that. So note, one of the strongest El Ninos to what could arguably be the strongest La Nina in our recorded history based off the Ocean Nino Index. So we're looking at this one as the what if if, if as, a, as an analog, as a what if analog, if La Nina comes in fast and it's strong. So how well did March and April line up to this March and April? Well, here is our, um, this is our t temperature pattern in March and April. So mild and cold. And there is something about that where you go, okay, I, I kind of see something similar to that, but should we read much into that? Probably not because I made a mistake. No, I didn't. That is the temperature pattern. I thought I was looking at precip. There's the precip. The precip pattern, though, was very, very wet in this area. Much above average precipitation, March to April. And very dry in the West. So what an odd kind of look at things. Um, I, I, given how warm it was, it was very warm and, and wet start to the year. Um, next. What did, in fact, I think I blew this up differently. There we go. What did the ocean temperatures do in April and beyond? Well, in April, um, we were quite warm through here. 
and we were beginning to get this El Nino out and La Nina coming back in. By the time I got to July, we saw this. So cold water really surfacing here. Some warmer water in the main development region, but quite a bit of cool water north of that. And then cold water in the Gulf of Alaska. And what's so interesting to me about this pattern is how we had cold here. Warm, that's a very interesting PDO signal. That's what I'm trying to say. And then cold to the south. And why I'm so interested in it is that by July through August, we ended up getting this as our temperature pattern, very warm across the north, slightly cooler than average in the southern plains and high plains and western plains. And on the precipitation side, it was kind of a, a mess, um, very dry in places, but extremely wet in others. And I'm going to be honest, I don't know that I can necessarily call out 1973 as one of our strong analogs. I don't think I can, and there's a, several reasons for that. Um, one, I don't think we're going to make this kind of epic collapse. I think it's going to come down somewhere into the maybe the weak La Nina by October, not strong like this one did. And two, this is where I brought this map up. This was an interesting year in that we had this pattern of ocean temperatures, which drove a deep trough of low pressure here, but ended up giving us blocking pattern that was east in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And that's a pretty rare configuration in summer. And what was interesting about the way that this all set up was what it did to the hurricane season. We did have a, a relatively, I would call this a normal hurricane season overall, but the way that blocking pattern set up in the east just um, has me wondering if, it, if we should give it much weight overall in the forecast. So to bring this kind of full circle here. I want to do two things. Remember when we looked at this a moment ago, how the CFSV2 was no longer dropping this down into just deep La Nina territory as it had? Well, I went ahead and pulled up the newest forecasts. It's three-month sliding window, May, June, July, June, July, August. You can see how this goes. So now we've got the CFSV2 calling for a much stormier start to spring, but there's that migration of those dry conditions we talked about. June, July, August, no longer aggressively bringing in the drought conditions farther into the Corn Belt, for example, out of the plains into the Corn Belt as it had. July, August, September, and just take a look, August, September, October, that's a much, much weaker progression in this particular model of delivering those drier conditions. And while we're at it, I'm just gonna show you this one more time. We did this last week. Uh, let's go to the three month outlook and just quickly slide through these precipitation patterns again. This being the May, June, July. This is the June, July, August. This is the probability, This excuse me, not probability. This is the deviations from normal based off of the Climate Prediction Center's forecast. That's June, July, August precipitation pattern. And then we've got the July, August, September. So what's important to note is that the new CFS V2 is not as aggressive as the uh, CPC's forecast at building this drought into this section of the Western Corn Belt later. And I just wanted to point out those differences here. All right, I've got one last thing I want to share with you, and that is going to be the precipitation patterns in South America. This is the next 10 days, but we are now mid to late April. And why I bring that up is because this is the beginning of the dry season. So when you just see these barely drier than normal anomalies here, there's actually no precipitation forecast for that region heavy into very far southern Brazil, like uh, Rio Grande do Sul, parts of Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina, but almost no moisture being forecast in this area. And that is an early shutoff of the, of the um, Brazilian monsoon. That makes the recent rains they just got into this area critical for the Safrina crop because it's going over dry. Take note that uh, Minas Gerais, based off satellite estimated rainfall, has been very dry as of late. So that's what I want to share with you all today. Uh, we're going to continue this narrative and putting the story together for the rest of this week. You guys have a good week and we'll talk tomorrow. Thanks.